Life can go sideways. We get hit with unexpected things, things that begin to throw us off kilter. We thought we were pretty balanced with everything we were doing, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, we're going sideways. If you've ever been in a car and hit black ice, you know that feeling of going sideways and feeling like there's nothing you can do about it. Today I want to talk with you about what to do when life goes sideways, and we're going to look at the Old Testament book of Habakkuk for two reasons. One, who doesn't want to say Habakkuk? That's just awesome. But also, Habakkuk is the perfect example for us today, because Habakkuk addresses some of those critical issues and questions that we have in the 21st century. Now, here's a fellow who grew up during the good old days of Josiah, the king, under the revival, and everything was going well. But now Josiah had died, and so had the revival, and now Habakkuk's in a situation where everything is falling apart. Morally, politically, financially, things are beginning to decay, and he feels like life is beginning to go sideways. You know, one of the issues when life goes sideways for a nation or a community or a church or a family is that often those who are not guilty of doing anything wrong are still swept away in the events that are taking place. Just like when you're a passenger in the car of somebody who hits gravel, you didn't hit the gravel, but you're in the car, and so you're swept away by the events of someone else. And that's exactly where Habakkuk was. His nation was in decay, and he and thousands of others who were good godly men and women found themselves swept away sideways in the events that were taking place. And he, in this short little book, just three chapters, shares with us some of the key principles that we need to know to keep ourselves focused, steady, and balanced when our lives go sideways. We're just going to deal with one of them today, and it's in chapter 3, verses 17 down to 19. Just three little verses, but some incredible truths all revolving around one principle, and the principle is this. We need to learn to thank God even when things go wrong. When you and I learn to live lives of gratitude, even when things around us are beginning to fall, we will live under the hedge of protection that gratitude provides. Now, Habakkuk was not grateful for their religious system at that time. It was a disaster. He was not grateful for the moral decay that he found himself surrounded by. He was not grateful for the political turmoil that his nation was in. He wasn't grateful for the economic troubles that were cascading in around him. But he was still very grateful. And in these three verses, he gives us the things he's grateful for. And in the 21st century, especially here in America today, these are things we need to focus on as we watch all of life begin to swirl in unique ways around us. The first one is in verses 17 and the first part of verse 18. Let me read it to you. He says, Though the fig should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. He said, everything's going wrong. Here's all the stuff he could complain about. He said, though all of this is happening, watch what he does. First line of verse 18. Yet I will exalt the Lord. First thing that we need to understand is that we can thank God. We can be grateful to God that he is always sovereign. Situations change. Good, bad, up, down. They change. But God does not. The word for Lord here, by the way, is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. And it means that self-existent, eternal, changeless, covenant-keeping God. He said, when everything else is unstable, unsteady, and unreliable, I am thankful that I can trust my God. We may not always know God's plans, but we always know that God has a plan. 
in the midst of everything that's going sideways and all the things that trouble you, we can be grateful that we serve a sovereign God. If you're his follower, he has a place for you in heaven. It's already ready waiting for you. He's sovereign. He said he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. He will always be with you. He will lead you and he will guide you and he will provide for you. You and I serve a sovereign God and even when we don't know what he's doing, we know he is doing. He's sovereign and we can be thankful for that. The next one is in this second half of verse 18. Tiny little line, but an amazingly large principle. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Not only do we thank God that he's always sovereign, but we thank God that his salvation is secure. Life is uncertain at best. 2020 and the first couple of months here in 21 have proven that. Life at best is uncertain, but our salvation is eternal. It's guaranteed. And the word salvation in the Hebrew doesn't just mean get to go to heaven. That's what Americans focus on, and I'm glad we're going. But salvation in a biblical sense is so much more than that. Salvation means deliverance. It means rescue. God delivered us from who we were. He rescues us out of our plight and our circumstances and our situations. When God saved you, he saved every aspect of you, saved you from your past, saved you during your present, and he saved you for a future that you could never have without him. And what Habakkuk says is, I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. But notice, these are choices he makes. He is very aware of what's going on around him. You and I are very aware of what's going on around us. The moral shift in our culture, the economic uncertainty that lies ahead, the political circus that is taking place all around us. We are very aware of all of the negative things, and yet... Habakkuk, in very similar circumstances, makes a choice of the will. He said, I will exalt the Lord my God, and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He's choosing to rejoice. You may not be aware of this, and so this will be new to you. If it's not new, it's a great reminder. You and I cannot control the things that come into our life, but we very much can control the things that come out of our mouth. We need to make a physical, mental, emotional choice to exalt God, our Savior. Rather than exalting the issues, always talking about them, always complaining about them, always griping about what's going on, always wishing somebody would fix something, we need to choose to exalt in the God who gives us salvation. Many of us do this. Every, e well, almost every evening, sometimes I lay down and I'm actually asleep, I think, before my head hits the pillow, but most evenings, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is make a gratitude list. I do it on purpose. And I go through the day and I begin to thank God for every positive thing I can thank him for family, friends, uh, financial miracle, whatever it is. And some days it's very small. You know, Lord, I want to thank you that I didn't lose my temper in that situation and look like an idiot and embarrass you. Finding things to thank God for, it transforms the way we think. If we're always focused on all of our problems, it changes the way we look at life. But if we begin to focus on the God who gives us an eternal salvation, it begins to change the way we approach life. This is not some kind of psychological band-aid. This is a biblical way to view life. We thank God that he is always sovereign, and we thank God that his salvation is eternal. We are in it. This is why the New Testament says, even I live or I die, I am in Christ. In other words, the things that happen are going to happen. But what matters most is I am secure in God. He is with me now. 
In fact, you remember Jesus saying, I am with you even to the end of the age. Several years back, somebody asked me, well, what happens at the end of the age? Something brilliant happens. This age that you and I live in, God is with us every moment of every day. Whether you sense him or not, he is there, always there, waiting and working with you. But at the end of the age, now hear me, at the end of the age, he's no longer with you. Why? Because you are with him. We're always going to be together with Christ. Right now, he's with us here in our circumstances. But at the end of this age, we're going to be with him in his presence, in his kingdom, in a fullness of everything that he has prepared for us. Not because of anything we have done or earned, but because of his grace. And when we called out and asked for salvation, deliverance and rescue, he did it. That's something to be grateful for. The last one's here in verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like Heinz feet. That's not Heinz ketchup. We'll get to that in a minute. And makes me walk on my high places. Did you catch that? We thank God, first of all, verse 17, first half of 18, because he's always sovereign. Your problems aren't sovereign. Your God is sovereign. We thank God because his salvation is eternal. We're always going to be with him here, and then he's going to be with us there. But third, we thank God that his strength is providing steadfastness for us. See, when we stand, or sorry, when we can't stand anymore in our own strength, we have to come to him. Notice this line. The Lord God is my strength. It's important to understand Habakkuk didn't say the Lord God gives me strength. Rather, he is my strength. And strength here in Hebrew means my ability. When you and I engage in a relationship with God, in prayer, Bible study, hanging out with other believers, worshiping him, when we interact with him, he is our strength. He doesn't give us something he enables us to experience him in a way which provides us the ability to get through situations we would not be able to get through otherwise. We never truly know God's strength until we run out of our own strength. Did you catch that? So often we do just what we're able to do, try to maintain in our own wheelhouse, to use a boxing term. It isn't until we run out of our own strength that we understand God's ability to give us strength. Habakkuk gives us two analogies here. He says, he, he makes my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk on my high places. The hinds feet here, speaking of an animal, it speaks of grace and ability and agility and swiftness. The ability and the agility to move in shifting situations, to always stay on our feet no matter what comes punching at us from the enemy. It isn't us that does it. It is God in us that does it. And the high places is speaking of the places on those mountaintops where deer live to stay out of the danger zone from all of the critters that were trying to kill them down below. You and I live in a world full of those that are trying to knock us off balance, but his strength gives us the agility to bounce, to move, to use a boxing term, bob and weave. His strength gives us the ability to stay on the mountaintop where the enemy cannot destroy us. Yes, life can knock us sideways. Yes, things come at us that we cannot handle, but that's okay. Habakkuk proves to us in his own words that when we engage in a relationship with God who is sovereign, who gives us eternal salvation, we have a strength that is steadfast, immovable. The reason I get so excited about this is because my life, like yours, is one series of what? after another. My life is a, a constant case of shifting and moving. And yet in the midst of all of that, I have found myself being able to quote from the, from the Proverbs and the Psalms and the New Testament and the prophets words about my God that remind me it is well with my soul. 
Though everything else around me falls apart, my God has saved me and will keep me until I get to heaven. And if you're his follower, he'll do the same for you as well. Now, if you're watching this and you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus, you're not saved, you're not delivered, you're not rescued, but you can be. You see, Jesus Christ came and he lived like one of us, yet without sin. And then he died a sacrificial death so that he could pay the price to rescue and deliver us from ourselves and from our sin. And then he arose from the dead. He's alive today. And if you will call on his name and become his follower, he will transform your life and begin to give you the ability to find peace, joy, and purpose in the midst of a life that's constantly going sideways. If you're watching and ready to give your life to Christ right now, pray this with me. Jesus, forgive me of my sin, the sin of living as if you don't matter. Come into my life and be my God. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've prayed that, I'm asking you to do two things. One, tell somebody. God blesses you every time you do. And number two, send me a note so I can get you some information that's going to help you in your new relationship with Jesus Christ. So, Christian, your life's going slideways. You're sliding back and forth. Don't fear. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I'm asking you to remember two very important things. Number one, God loves you very much. And number two, I am so proud to be your pastor. The Lord be with you.